Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we welcome you here in the Northside Baptist Church. May God bless you. We appreciate our members that's come in as well as the visitors. Always glad to have visitors to come and be with us here in our services. And we welcome you today. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. And if you'll call someone on your phone there in your home, just get the phone and call someone. Have them to tune in and get this hour. We'll try to be a blessing to them. And especially some shut-in. If you'll do that, you'll be doing them a favor you do us a favor, and we appreciate it very much. So we're counting on you. Take your Bible, will you please, and turn to Hebrews chapter 6, the reading of God's Word today. While you're turning to Hebrews chapter 6, I want to say just a word to the radio listen audience. Most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. If you're not getting the daily broadcast, I hope that you'll tune in through the week and get the daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon. We'll try to be a blessing to you as we break the bread of life each day at 12 noon. A lot of people are very much unconcerned about the work of God, kind of like the old man sitting on the riverbank chewing his tobacco. Young boy fell in the river and began to scream. He said, I, I, can't, uh, I can't swim. I, I, somebody help me. I can't swim. And he was screaming and fighting the water. Hollered out the old man, help me, help me. I can't swim. The old man sitting there, chewing his tobacco, said, Well, I can't swim either, but I'm not hollering about it. And so a lot of people like that today, they can't see the real need of learning about the things of God or going to church as they should, sitting by, unconcerned, don't care. But we appreciate you that are concerned and you that love the Lord and love the Word of God. And I hope now you've found the place in Hebrews chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we'll do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that oft come upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by which it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things are company of salvation, uh, th though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your works and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. My text is found in verse 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things are company of salvation, Though we thus speak. Now I want to speak to you today on this line of thought. Things that accompany salvation. Now these are vital life signs of having been born again. The signs I shall give you today will help you to know whether or not you have experienced a second birth. Been born of God's spirit and God's word because these things should accompany salvation. I trust you keep that in mind. A good doctor, after he performs surgery, he watches that patient very closely, and he looks for every sign of life in many different ways in that patient. He's wondering whether or not the patient is going to survive, and he begins to look at many different uh, features uh, there pertaining to that patient in order to see some signs of life. Well, my patient survive. Will you make it? Well, there should be some signs of spiritual life 
in the life of every child of God and they accompany salvation. These things I want to pass on to you today. I hope you follow me in the scriptures. I'll be giving you other verses. Now the first thing that should accompany salvation, of course, is a new life from God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now that's as plain as it can be spoken. If you have the Son of God, you have eternal life. If you have not the Son of God in your heart, you don't have eternal life. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Every unregenerated person is dead, spiritually speaking. He's dead in trespasses and he's dead in sin. And the only way he can be made alive is by the quickening power of God when Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit comes into his heart to live. And if you don't have that sign of life, the new life, then there's something wrong. If you don't have Jesus Christ by faith in your heart, then there's something wrong. That should accompany salvation. Secondly, a new appetite for God's word should accompany salvation. Do you have a desire for the word of God? Is there longing in your heart for the scriptures? When God saved me, I began to read the Bible. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, he said, as a newborn babe in Christ, you should desire the word of God. Just as a little infant that is born into this world desires its mother's breast, so should you desire the word of God. It desires the milk in order to live and, and survive. And so should every Christian desire the milk of God's word. If you don't have any desire whatsoever in your heart for the word of God, you better check out because that desire accompanies salvation. Jeremiah the prophet said in Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and, they, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoice of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah said the word of God was a real joy to my heart, and I long for the word of God. In Psalms chapter 119, the psalmist said in verse 162, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Back in the days of the writing of the Bible, those armies would go out and conquer the enemy, and they would take the spoils, and they looked for great spoils in the territory where they conquered. And the psalmist said, I long for the word of God like I would great spoils that I find out in the enemy's territory. There should be a longing in your heart for the word of God in that manner. Rejoice at the word of God. Have a desire for it. It is your very food, your very life. You survive. You grow stronger. You grow more spiritual through the knowledge of the word of God as you take it and assimilate it in your heart and mind and there cogitate upon it as you sojourn for God. It makes you stronger and a better and a more powerful Christian. Just like a babe born into this world cannot survive without milk, without food, neither can a child of God survive spiritually in that sense unless he's feeding upon the word of God, longing for the things of God, desiring to be better and stronger for God. You should have that appetite. You take when a child is born into this world, if that baby doesn't have an appetite for a uh, milk and you just won't take food, there's something wrong with that child. It must have nourishment in order to survive. Now, if a Christian, a person that is saved, has no desire whatsoever for the Word of God, you better check up. You may not be saved. That should accompany salvation. Then we move on to the third thing that accompanies salvation, and that is a new walk in the Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, and like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Someone said back in the days of Billy Sunday, when he would run great revivals, 
have great citywide campaigns that many of those drunkards would get saved. They'd had a bad habit of pulling up in front of the saloon, tying their horse, going in, spending maybe many hours in the beer saloon. But when they received Christ as their Savior, Billy Sunday said, what you need to do now is to walk in newness of life and tie your horse to a different hitching post. And every child of God should do likewise. When you get saved, you should associate with a new crowd, walk with a new group, associate with God's people, have good fellowship with the people of God and love the things of the Lord and not tie your horses to the same old hitching post that is go to the same old worldly places of amusement, the same places of sin and iniquity that you did before Jesus Christ came into your heart. There must be a distinction between the child of God and the men of this world. All this world can see no difference between the Christian and the lost person. There must be a difference. God requires that difference. And if you don't have a desire to walk after the things of God, you need to check up because that accomplishes salvation. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, he said, For you were sometime darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. God said his people should walk as children of light. You're in, in, in spiritual light now. You're not in spiritual darkness, but you're in light. The light of the gospel. You should walk in that light. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says you ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. If you want to be a strong Christian, a stalwart Christian, a Christian that's a good soldier, then you must walk in the light that God gives you and you can abound more and more as you sojourn for God. God wants you to do that. If you don't do that, then of course you're not doing that which pleases the Lord. We find the Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God and he walked with God every day and for 365 years he walked with God without a break and God took him. Now God wants us to walk with him, walk in his way, do what he would have us to do and not in the old road we travel before we come to know the Lord. Then we come to number four. The fourth thing that's come to salvation is a new joy in the Lord. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 11, the Bible says that not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now receive the atonement. There should be a joy in the Lord, a, a desire to serve God with enthusiasm. Now you need to do that. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 8, the Bible said there was great joy in that city. You find there that Philip the Evangelist went down into Samaria. He preached the gospel and many people turned to God. And when they did, there was great joy in that city. They were thrilled. They were happy. They were shouting the praises of God because of what God was doing in the city of Samaria. There should be a joy in your heart given to you by the Spirit of God that this world can't give, neither can this world take away. Have great joy in God. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 52, the Bible said the people there, they worshiped Jesus, and then he ascended back to heaven, and the Bible said they then returned to Jerusalem with great joy. On the way back to Jerusalem, after leaving the Mount of Olives, these Christians were thrilled. They were ecstatic. They went forward praising God and rejoicing because of Jesus Christ, their Savior. There should be a real joy in your heart because you love God. Many years ago, there was a church where the, uh, the old deacon would, like, would shout. He just left to shout and, and the old time preacher liked it that way. He liked to see his people get happy. He liked to see them shout and praise God. And uh, he didn't care as long as it was in the spirit. And he didn't care how high they jumped as long as they walked right when they hit the ground. But he left this particular church and a new minister came in from the seminary. And he was more reserved. And, and he didn't like uh, Muslimism. He didn't like to see people shouting and praising God. And so uh, this old deacon, though, he would get happy and shout when they would sing and 
when the preacher would preach. And so the young minister called a couple of his deacons together. He said, now listen, we can't have this shouting taking place in our church anymore. The old preacher's gone. I don't believe in it myself. And, and we're just not going to have it. I, I want to appoint you to go and pay him a visit and uh, see if you can't stop him from shouting. And so they went to his house and he wasn't at home. They asked his wife where he was. She said he's down in the bottom land plowing. And so they went down to the bottom land, uh, what they call the bottoms in those days, and uh, found the old man plowing. He came to the end of the row and he saw the two men standing there. And they came down. They said, now, Brother Deacon, we don't offend you and we love you, but our pastor sent us down here to tell you that we can't have any more shouting going on in our church and praising God like you do. It's got to be put to a stop. And we came down uh, just to see if we couldn't talk with you about it and get you to stop doing that. And the old man, uh, uh, tears came in his eyes. His lips began to tremble. And, and he said to those fellows, he said, you know, when I began to think about how God has saved me and he gave me of all of my sins and how God has saved my wife and how God has saved my children and how God has blessed us and provided us with food to eat and clothes to wear and, and a little house to live in. He said, when I begin to think about these things, he said, I can't have, he said, praise God, hold these mules while I shout. Now, beloved, when it's real, you just have to let God do it in your heart and not quench the spirit of God. And it was genuine. And you should have joy in the Lord. You take the people of this world, they go out here, they go to the place of pleasure and sports, they go maybe to a football game and, and their team makes a touchdown and they'll throw their hats in the air and, and uh, they'll shout and holler and yell and, and almost um, uh, deafen you by the noise. And, and uh, they do that because they're enthused. They're happy over the fact that their team made a touchdown. And yet sometimes we come to the house of God and we sit back like we thought our mother-in-law was going to move in on us and stay about six months. Sit there like our best friend's dead and, and we just don't know what to do about it. And we have more to shout about than the people of this world. We have more to be happy about than the people at the football game. Beloved, we have eternal life. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Our home is beyond the blue. We have much to praise God to shout about. And we shouldn't quench the Spirit of God. Then we come to the fifth thing that accompanies salvation. And that is a new song in the heart. In Psalms chapter 40 and verse 3. The Bible said he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, and many shall see it and fear and trust the Lord. So God's given us a new song. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine wherein it says, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual singing, singing, making melody, in your heart to the Lord. God said do that. He said sing songs. The old hymn sang the psalms. And then he said sing spiritual songs. That's what our trio did this morning. That's what you call a spiritual song. When we sang out of the hymnal. That was called songs. And then of course in those days. They would sing the psalms. And they enjoyed their singing. And they loved to sing. That was a great man. By the name of Iris Sankey that directed the uh, singing for uh, Dwight L. Moody for many, many years. He traveled around with Moody and his singing touched many hearts. And then one day he was uh, uh, sailing on a steamboat down a river and out here in the, in the west. And, and as he traveled down this river, there's a great number of people on the steamboat. And they knew Sankey was on there. And they said, Sankey, we want you to sing a song. And he said, all right. And they suggested some. But he said, no, I want to sing, Jesus like a shepherd leadeth me. He said, I'd like to sing that one. They said, that's fine. And then Sankey stood up and he sang that beautiful song, Jesus like a shepherd leadeth me. And when he finished singing the song, a man approached him and said, uh, uh, Mr. Sankey, were you in the army? He said, yes, I was in the army during the Civil War. I joined in 1960 said, were you at a certain place in 1962? He said, yes. He said, were you keeping guard at a certain place 
in 19, uh, rather in, uh, in 1862, not 1962, of course. He said, yes, yes, I was. He said, all right, I was in the Confederate Army. And he said, I spotted you on guard duty. I spotted that uh, uh, blue uniform. He said, uh, sir, I took my rifle and I took good aim at your heart. And I was about to pull the trigger on my rifle when you started singing this song. Jesus, like a shepherd, leadeth me. He said, sir, when you started singing that beautiful song, I dropped my gun. I couldn't shoot you, sir. I couldn't do it. And there they hugged each other and praised God for what God did through Sankey singing that beautiful song, they're doing the Civil War. And so we need to have a song in our hearts. Then the sixth thing that accompanies salvation is a new love for the things of God. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, the Bible said, we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Jesus loved you first. And you don't love God till you come to know him. And when you come to know him, then the Holy Spirit of God spreads abroad in your heart the love of God. And you love him because he first loved you. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. As a Christian, the love of God and the things of God should take the place of the love of this world in your heart. Does that happen to you? If not, it ought to. It should. You should love God and the things of God more than you love the sinful things of this world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. When you get saved, then you should desire new things, spiritual things, pure things, holy things, and not let the devil sidetrack you. There's a man one time bought him a hunting dog. He left to hunt. He wanted to go hunting. He took that dog out, and sure enough, the dog struck a bear track. And he was traveling behind the dog, and he was hot on the track of the bear. And all of a sudden, the dog stopped and turned and went to the left. And what he did, a deer had crossed the bear track, and he left the bear track and took off after the deer. He run the deer for a while, and lo and behold, he stopped all of a sudden and turned to the right. And what had happened, a rabbit had crossed the deer track, and he left the deer and took off after the rabbit. And finally, when his master caught up with him, you know what he was doing? He had treed a little mouse in a mouse hole and they're barking at it. The mouse had crossed the rabbit track and he took off after the mouse. And you have a lot of Christians like that today. The devil will deviate you from the track you should run and your track is a track of God, the path of God that he has for you. Don't let the devil detour you. Don't let the devil sidetrack you. Stay on the track and keep your eye on the goal and move on for God. I'm going to mention the seventh thing that accompanies salvation. And that is a new desire to give of our means to God. Now, it's just about to paralyze you and disturb you and cause you to have a nervous breakdown whenever you realize you ought to give something financially into God's work. Do you grieve over what you give to God? If so, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. It ought to be an honor, a privilege, an opportunity to give of your means to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through that chapter. I won't have time to read it. It's a wonderful chapter. Paul commended these people because they had given out of their poverty. Means to help him financially to carry on the work of God. He commended them for that. You have an income. God has given you power to, make, uh, to get wealth. That should be a longing and desire in your heart with enthusiasm. To take a portion of that and put it in the work of God. You ought to have that desire. More so than you'd have the desire of cramming money in the bank. What you put in the bank, you're going to leave here one of these days. Inflation's eating it up. You're going to leave here and leave every dime of it. 
And what you put into God's work goes on to heaven and you'll face that again at the judgment seat of Christ. You should be far more enthused about putting money in the bank of heaven than you do the bank of this earth. Now you should. That's the way it should be. God wants it to be like that. But a lot of people, they get so fidgety. They're more fidgety than a peg-legged man at a chainsaw convention. Now they're afraid the pre preacher's going to ask for money and they're afraid they're going to have to give a little something. While you ought to say, preacher, how about taking up an offering? And we want to give something. And we want to give more and more. And if a preacher receives an offering, somebody will say, well, can we have another offering? We want to give a little more. It's always a privilege to give because you're laying up treasures in heaven. And not to be so stingy until you will skin a flea for his hiding teller. Beloved, listen to me. You need to give because you love God. And one dime out of every dollar you earn. I don't care how old or young you may be. You may be a junior. And uh, you get an allowance or somebody. Uh, you pay you a little money to cut the grass. One dime out of every dollar is God's. If you don't give that to God, you're taking God's money and spending it. God's money is not to be taken and put on anything. Other than getting out the gospel and putting God's work. Oh, you're saying I preach everything. Susie, you know, she's sick. And she needs some medicine. Don't you think I can take my tithe and buy her a little medicine? If you want to steal God's money and do it, you have to face God. That's wrong. Now, if you want to take your own money and buy Susan some medicine, all right, that's good. But if you take God's tithe and spend that on Aunt Susie, you are robbing God. You're guilty of taking God's money and spending it where you should not. The tithe of the Lord goes into the work of God. Everything you give above the tithe, what you do is your business. When you give above your tithe in the work of God, you're giving Jesus a little love offering because you love him. The tithe is already his. That's to be placed in his work. And the love offering above that tenth is because you love Jesus and want to give a little extra because you love him. But must rem you must remember that tithe cannot be taken and spent anywhere Anything pertaining to your livelihood, for the sick or the dead or whatnot, if you do, you're sinning against God and doing wrong, and you'll have to pay. When God collects, then he's going to collect that with interest. I know people today, they rob God all their lives when they're able to work, hoarded up money, came down maybe too old to work, and turned right around, and something happened, take every dime of it. What's happening, God's just collecting that you've robbed him of over the years. God is the best collector that's ever existed, and he can collect. I'd much rather give because I love God, and it's an honor and a privilege, and lay up treasures in heaven, than God have to take it later on when I'm flat on my back and can do nothing about it. And you need to give. Barnabas sold his land and gave all to God. The tithe is the Lord's. You need to realize that it's not yours. I don't care what kind of income you may have or who you are, man, woman, boy, or girl. If it's an income. A tenth of that is the Lord. You may never give it to him. He may have to collect it later with interest, but it's his. And if you give it to him because you love him, he'll bless it and use it and give it back to you more ways than you can dream of. And then you'll be rewarded for it at the judgment seat of Christ. The tithe belongs to God. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. The offering above the tithe is a love gift that you give to God because you love him. And then I must hurry. I merely mentioned these other three. And the next thing that should accompany salvation is a new service. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 7, with goodwill, doing service as the Lord and not to men. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, how you have turned to God from idols to serve the living God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know as your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Then number nine, a new will. To please God in all of our ways. We should have a will or de a desire to please God in all of our ways. You ought to read Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. I won't have time to give that to you today. But you ought to read that. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. In fact you should memorize that. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his pleasure. Then finally. The tenth thing that accompanies salvation is a new expectation to someday go to heaven and be like Jesus. First John chapter 3 and verse 2. 
Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you have a desire to go to heaven? Do you have a desire to be like Jesus? If not, if you're a Christian, you should have. That desire should be in your heart. There's a man one time on his dying bed. The doctor waited on him, ministered to him. The man said, give me the Bible. They gave him the Bible. The man read a portion of God's word. And he said, let's pray. And uh, he prayed. And then he said, uh, doctor, I want you to be honest with me. Is death near? The doctor said, sir, I must be honest at your request. Death is just on the outside of the door. He said, sir, would you please open the door and tell him to come on in because I'm ready. I want to go home. Shall we stand? Father, I pray that you'll take the message today and that you'll use it to thy glory here in the auditorium and even out in the radio listening audience. God made thy word find a lodging place in many hearts today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if we're still on the air, I want to say the radio listen audience, this, this message today is on tape and available as well as the message will be tonight. 